I don't remember in my lifetime, and perhaps you don't remember in your lifetime, that you have witnessed such mass conversion into holy orthodoxy. And again, if you read the book of Acts, you find in many instances, and St. Paul laid his hand on them. Many have received the grace of the Holy Spirit through the hands of Paul and Peter, and the apostles and their successors. He is worthy. 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 And he commissioned his disciples. He said to them, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, not only Greeks, not only Antiochians, not only Russians or Serbians or Romanians. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We thank the Almighty God for this beautiful day because once again I say to you, this is the day which the Lord has made. How is it possible that someone who thought people that made the sign of the cross were obviously not Christians? Or how can it be possible that someone who thought that anyone who used the word Eucharist was probably religiously suspect? Or how is it possible that someone who thought that anyone who in any way gave any credence to the Virgin Mary was obviously a pagan? How is it possible that a person like that could end up crossing himself, receiving the Eucharist, and loving the Virgin Mary? How is it possible that a person who hated liturgy would end up in a liturgical church? Uh, we did not set out to discover orthodoxy. We set out to find out what the ancient church was really like. And in doing so, we discovered orthodoxy. I think the thing that <clears throat> brought us to uh, at least look at the church was after almost a decade of campus outreach and evangelism in the 60s, uh, we realized as we read the New Testament that the biblical pattern for reaching out is not to just go out by yourself, but to be sent out, be part of a church, sent out, and then bring the people that respond back into the church. And of course, we weren't a church. And so uh, as we as we studied the scriptures, we became convinced that biblically we had to be tied into the church to do what we were doing. So in 68, most of us uh, that are now involved resigned. In fact, Father Jack Sparks and myself uh, left Campus Crusade for Christ and we began to work with the youth of the early 70s in, uh, at UC Berkeley. And uh, I uh, had a, a ranch where I worked with the notorious and famous uh, hippie communes in Northern California, where the most radical edge of these students who could not find any answers to life fled. There was still something missing. And in 1973, some of us who had formerly been with Campus Crusade for Christ once again got together. We were the ones who essentially formed the core of what became the New Covenant Apostolic Order to establish churches around the country, a group that eventually became the Evangelical Orthodox Church. And it became that because as we explored the whole matter of what it meant to be, to be and to have church, we knew that we had to do something more than we had done before. And so this group of men with whom I was associated at that time in 1973 asked various members of the group to do research in various areas of what is the truth, that is to answer that question. The New Covenant Apostolic Order pursued the study of the ancient apostolic fathers, 
of the early church fathers on up through, uh, through St. Athanasius. Uh, we were completely amazed at what we found in St. Ignatius, the great uh, patriarch of Antioch from the year 67 through the year 107. We found their view of the episcopacy, their view of the ancient uh, uh, presbyteriate and diaconate and the way the church functioned in that first and second century were revolutionary to us. To realize for the first time that outside of the 12 apostles, there were bishops. I'd always been taught that there were no bishops, that the bishops were basically a corruption of the church. Well, here we have a bishop who lived in the first century. We know maybe two apostles did, maybe three. The majority of them are still alive, and yet we have a bishop here that none of the apostles wrote against. As we read, a whole new world came into existence. A world where, without any question, there was, number one, vitality. But where there was also, secondly, there was liturgy. To discover that there was liturgy in the ancient church came as a horrendous shock. To find out that there was liturgy in that Bible that I thought I knew so well was frightening. And I began to ask, what else is there in there that I don't understand? I began in, to run into the word in the Bible, the word Eucharist. Oh, we don't usually translate it that way in the English Bible. We just translate it the giving of thanks or giving thanks. But the word was there. The very word that we took into the English language as Eucharist was right there in the Bible. All the time we wanted to be a people who abided in Christ, yet somehow we missed in John 6 that that it says that he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. It came to us in such a uh, wonderful point in time where in the Orthodox faith we could land by participating in the Eucharist and know for certain without doubt that we were abiding in our Lord Jesus Christ and that we could follow him being nourished through the Eucharist. Having discovered the church as body of Christ, community, in, in that sense of community, having discovered the church as the pillar and ground of the truth, and having discovered the church as worship, there was only really one thing left for us to do, and that is get into the church. Way back some years ago, Father John Barkey, when a high school student, had come to one of my Bible studies in Berkeley. And he got acquainted, and his name somehow got on my mailing list. And he kept track of what we were doing, and when he saw in 77, early 77, that we were moving toward orthodoxy, he wrote and asked for some of our papers. I sent him some and said, please don't show them to anybody else. These are private papers. And he immediately took them and showed them to Father Alexander. And I was so impressed by those letters that I took them to the faculty at St. Vladimir Seminary, and, and that was the beginning. And uh, I can remember when Father Schmeyman came out to speak to us uh, in the early 80s. Uh, he said, now, for, regardless of what else you do, he said, get to know all the Orthodox. Don't just uh, get to know us, because when you come into the Orthodox Church, you'll be joining the whole church. So he said, get to know the Greek people, get to know the Antiochian people, the Serbians. And so we took him at his word and began then to meet other uh, clergy and uh, laity. And we felt that somehow the Lord was re leading us to establish a relationship with uh, Orthodox, the Orthodox Church of the 20th century. Then in the summer of 80, 1985, uh, we felt the Lord prompting us to go to Constantinople and present ourselves. And uh, the reason we did this uh, was with the presence of so many Orthodox jurisdictions in America, we felt, let's start at the Ecumenical Patriarchate and see if we can't get some direction as to just how we ought to proceed and how we should come into the church. We did not receive satisfaction as to the guidance we had hoped to find in entering into canonical orthodoxy. It was, we believe, a step that was ordained by God because we learned a great deal from that whole experience. We came back from Istanbul 
And the very next uh, week, or two weeks later, uh, arrangements were made through Father John Bartke for some of our uh, priests and uh, at that time bishops to meet with the Patriarch of Antioch, Ignatius IV. We were very impressed by the fact that he has taken the name of our favorite ancient patriarch. And we met him in Los Angeles, California, along with Metropolitan Philip Saliba, the Archbishop of the Antiochian Archdiocese of North America. Very quickly we found ourselves on the way to becoming truly members of the Orthodox Church. Seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Seal. And I remember the Patriarch Ignatius IV, his beatitude told Metropolitan Philip, ask him to immediately begin a dialogue with us. And the Metropolitan told us, he says, I do not, I will not keep you waiting long. I will give you an answer to your questions and I will give you an answer as to whether or not you will be entering into the Antiochian Archdiocese. When Metropolitan Philip told us what to do, it took about five minutes for our synod to decide that we would do it, that uh, those of us who were the bishops of the Evangelic Orthodox Church would be happy to be presbyters, priests in the Orthodox Church. We would be, we would be honored to be priests in the Orthodox Church. Well, that was in the summer of 1985. By the fall of 1986, we were accepted. And then in February, my entire church of St. Athanasius Orthodox Church, then known as the Evangelical Orthodox Church, all the members of our parish were chrismated. So it was on February the 8th, 1987, that we found ourselves being ordained subdeacon and then deacon in the Orthodox Church. That just happened to be exactly 10 years to the day from the day that my assistant, Mark Dunaway, had sent to Father John Bartke the papers that he had requested. The most devout subdeacons to be deacons. <laughs> Wherefore, let us pray for them that the grace of the All Holy Spirit may come upon them. That date was a, 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 a thrilling occasion for us. I, I, I can't describe how, how it felt to be to be brought into the Orthodox Church after such a long trek, so many years of hoping and waiting, and then to be actually clergy, deacons in the Orthodox Church. We were humble, all of us were humble. We knew that we did not know, did not have a grasp of the Orthodox faith nearly so deeply as the average layman in the pew. Then the next Sunday, February the 15th, 1987, we came to the cathedral, St. Nicholas Cathedral in Los Angeles. For it was on that day that I was chrismated and also brought in as a deacon into the one holy Catholic and apostolic church to the Antiochian diocese. As I was in the church, St. Nicholas in Los Angeles, there were many, many things that went through my mind concerning what all was going to happen to me. There I was standing there, a man without any special education, a man with an opportunity to be a priest of God, ordained in the church of Jesus Christ. And then as I later went forward and had the towel of service put on my head, and as I stood for what seemed like forever, waiting for that part of the service to be over, I sensed something special in my life happening. And then as I went up and we walked around the altar and as I knelt by the altar and Archbishop Philip laid his hands on my head, a non-emotional man had an emotional experience. An experience that I will never forget because not only did the tears come to my eyes, but that tingling sensation of joy went through my body to know that I was being accepted into the Church of God that has been established forever. We wanted, and still want, and always want, to serve in that church. 
and that more humbling than ever, for we knew that we were not worthy to be priests in the Orthodox Church, and yet we were said to be worthy by our Metropolitan Philip. He is worthy. 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 But Metropolitan Philip said we were worthy, and we set out to become worthy, to serve as best we are able, and to do that which he commissioned us. And Metropolitan Philip, with the vision which he has, gave us a commission. He said, I want you to take orthodoxy to America. We have to bring this church from Byzantium to America. We have to bring it from Tsarist Russia to America. Psychologically, we're still not here, some of us. Now you're here. <laughs> <laughs> so do something about it. The question might arise, well, why should Americans become Orthodox? And as a matter of fact, it is our personal conviction and our personal desire that every single American have a chance to hear about the Orthodox faith and receive it. Why should that be so? To me, to be an Orthodox today is to be complete. For me, to be an Orthodox today is to understand that I'm part of that church that linked all the way back to Antioch. Why do we have confidence in this church? Because it is the true faith. It has continuity. All the groups and movements and denominations that all of us had been in, we knew who started them. The denomination that I grew up in was started in this country in 1827. His name, uh, and I knew the founder, but now we are connected with a church who, whose beginning is Christ himself and the holy apostles. To be part of a church that never experienced a division, to be part of a church that understands what it means to be linked to the fathers, to be linked to the Bible times, to be linked to a, to a communication of faith that's gone out through history down to this time. Will people respond to the Orthodox faith? I think the answer to that is rather self-evident. If just in these past few months, 2,000 people roughly have become a part of the Orthodox Church, people who had never heard about her before, then what should cause us to believe that there aren't many, many, many other thousands and thousands out there who really want to hear and who really want to know? This has been the most exciting thing of my life for the very thing that I, I look for from the very beginning, I found. I found home. I found the New Testament church. I found the church that was started by St. Peter and St. Paul. It was interesting, but I had never thought in categories of what was the name of the church that was, at, that was founded in Jerusalem at Pentecost? And was she still alive today? Or did she simply die away. And I've come to find out that there was a living expression of that church today in the Holy Orthodox Church. That was the name of the church at Pentecost. She was the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and she is still here today. That gives so much confidence because now I could even die in peace. That promise we made to our people that they'd have still waters, that they would have green pastures, that there would be a church around for them to raise their children and their grandchildren has come to pass because we know for sure that this historic church, even through its good days and through its bad days, still remains on this earth and it will be here when the Lord returns. The simple fact is people want to know spiritual reality and there's a world full of people out there who have given their hearts as best they know to an experience of church that in spite of all their efforts has not produced what they wanted. But I did discover, and many have discovered, that in this church, in the Holy Orthodox Church, that spiritual fulfillment is there. I believe Americans spot a bargain when they see it. And furthermore, I believe they understand a treasure when they find out about it they'll buy, they'll take the treasure, 
because they want it for what it can produce in their lives and in their hearts and with those whom they love and who love them. We thank God that those faithful people have found the true faith which once and for all was delivered to the saints. This faith which remains the best kept secret in America because of our laziness, we Orthodox. Because we have been busy taking care of our little ethnic ghettos. It is time that we let this light shine. America needs the Orthodox faith. I said to the Evangelical Orthodox in the past Sundays, I said, welcome home. Today, I say to America, come home, America. Come home to the faith of Peter and Paul.